Hello, good to see you guys again. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Herbal Gardens Homestead. We have something special today. It is about a video that I told you on another video that we're going to play and put together for you because we didn't get to play the whole thing. It's a, a video with Joel Salatin, and we're going to play it for you right after this. Well, today's a great episode. I'm going to have to show you right here on Herbal Gardens Homestead. When we were at the Farm Where You Live uh, festival the other day, it was awesome, okay? And I told you that I, I was going to uh, put an entire recording of Joel Salatin on for you guys to watch the whole thing. And um, I thought that maybe you would really like it. I wanted to show you guys something else. This is what I forgot to show you the last time. I am excited because it's here. My book from Joel Salatin. Hold on. Yep, there it is. It is awesome. I'm so happy I got it. It's so many pages of so much knowledge. I mean, it tells you everything. Oh my gosh, that you need to know. Oh, it's amazing. Look how thick it is. It's huge. I told you guys it's about that thick. Ooh, man. Right there. Polyface Designs by Joel Salatin. Man, I am so happy I got this book. And Chris Slattery and a forward by Justin Rhodes. Man. Thank you, Joel. I didn't have the... Um, book with me when I went to the the fair the other day to the homesteading fair farm where you live so he signed the back of one of my business cards and I just taped it into the book that's right <laughs> anyway we have him on recording and he told me that it was okay for me to go ahead and play this and I thought that it would be nice for you all to learn what he has to say. Okay? So, without further ado, Joel Salton. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Joel Salatin. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be back in this uh, part of the world. And uh, boy, you live in a, in a wonderful place. You know, the... Um, the sweet spot for pastured livestock uh, runs in a band around the earth, in a, in a circle around the earth, and uh, you're you're kind of on the on the southern edge of it in the U.S. The northern edge is about southern uh, Pennsylvania, but it runs right through, you know, Tennessee and Kentucky and out through Oklahoma, and and uh, then it goes on around to the um, to the you know, outer Mongolia there in uh, China and on the southern hemisphere, it's the same way. It runs around the pampas of Argentina to Serengeti in Africa. It's interesting, and they're, they're both, both those bands are about the same distance from the equator. So you're in the you're in that sweet spot. Uh, well done. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you, and I hope you're having a good time and that you're you're visiting all these wonderful vendors that um, that will leave you with hope and encouragement and inspiration and new ideas and things that you can do. So Megan asked me to, uh, to talk about uh, an idea that I've developed lately and that's called Homestead Tsunami. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but we are in a homestead tsunami in America right now. 
people are leaving urban hood and moving to rural hood in unprecedented numbers. If you've tried to buy a five acre place in the country lately, you know what's happened to the price in the last two years. Uh, what happens is there seems to be a, a kind of an understanding in the culture that when the wheels are getting ready to fall off, I don't want to be stuck in the city. Anybody feel that way? Yeah, right, okay. So, so there is this homestead tsunami. So I want to talk about this as a, 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 as a trend right now. You know, they say that, um, that, that crises do not make a trend. They simply make a trend more apparent. And I think that's what this one is. Uh, COVID did not make this trend, but it, it, it brought out some things that made, uh, that made this trend more, more um, acceptable or more real. So, I've got 10 things here that homestead is good for our families and our culture. The first one is for food security, okay? Food security. If you're up on things, you know what the cost of um, fertilizer has done, what the cost of centralization has done. So in the production sphere, just in the sheer production sphere, we're seeing major hiccups within the, within the system. Um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, with this war in Ukraine and everything, as, a, as fertilizer costs have, uh, in some cases, quadrupled in the last uh, 12 months, I mean, we're sitting there on our farm saying, man, that's cool. We don't buy any of it. And so, and so from a food security system to be able to have more production that doesn't depend on purchased chemical fertilizer, purchased inputs, and centralization, centralization is a, is a huge one. Um, you know, we have, we have lived with this uh, idea in agriculture and in food production that the only way to scale it, make it efficient, is to centralize everything. And so what happened during COVID was that with the centralization, you know, when you, when you put 5,000 people on a processing floor uh, in a dark, damp, cool environment, uh, you are really opening Pandora's box to pathogens, period. And that's why they spray them down so much with chlorine and everything else. But when you're running small-scale production facilities, you don't have all that issue. And so we believe in scale not by centralization, but by duplication. You know, the fact is that the U.S. has... 35 million acres of lawn and 36 million acres feeding and housing recreational horses. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to diss horses. Uh, that's another discussion. I can do another speech on the problem with horses. But, 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 but basically, that's 71 million acres of recreation, which is enough to feed the entire country without a single farm. So, you know, historically, small, efficient production has been the backbone of a culture. You go down to Mexico, they don't mow the interstate with big bat wing mowers. You go down in the evening and you'll see the farmers pulling in their, their milk cow. They have, them, uh, they have them pegged down with a peg, you know, and they can go out to the edge of the pavement and they've got these circles. Every quarter mile is another, uh, another milk cow and they mow their field edges. I was in uh, Talomipas down south of Monterey, uh, Mexico, um, and, and they got this great big city park. They don't mow it with mowers. Six farmers have uh, si uh, agreements with the city with six milk cows, and they mow the city park with six milk cows. Uh, you go to Italy, you know, um, every, every, ex every expressway cloverleaves takes 40 acres of land, you know, 10 acres per, you know, the entrance and exit ramps, and they, they divvy those up in little quarter acre lots, and they're all garden spots. People come out of the city and they and they and they garden those those expressway clover leaves. And they spend the weekend. They got a little shack, you know, a little tool place, and they they sleep in a little shack and and uh, they pick everything, take it into the city, and eat on it over the week, and and give it to their neighbors and friends. And um, and this is this is this is the way stuff is done. Okay, and so we are. We are, uh, in a lot of ways, we're back to the future. You know, we are reaching back to historical normalcy 
which integrated food instead of segregated food and did it on a human scale instead of an inhuman scale. Think about processing. What's happened to processing? Again, we're talking about centralization and human resource fragility. This really came up uh, during COVID. The lady was in the in our uh, farm store. She looks at the meat cases. She kind of gasped. I said, you know, what, what's up? What's the matter? She said, well, I was just down at Costco. Sirloin steak, $16 a pound. You got it for nine fifty a pound. Now, you know, most of our career, we've been a little more pricey than Costco. Well, what happened? Well, Tyson in the last 12 months has raised beef prices 32%. We've only raised ours 10 and that's been plenty. Why? Because we don't have the fragilities of a centralized system. I don't wake up every day wondering, oh man, I hope somebody down there in quadrant G uh, doesn't call uh, CDC on our, uh, on our uh, quarantine policies or call in sick, we got to let the whole quadrant, you know, go uh, into, you know, isolation for a week. The fact is, when things are disrupted, it's a lot better, it's a lot easier to navigate the shoals in a speedboat than an aircraft carrier. Now, there are business books that with the title, uh, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. And so we all know that nimbleness, nimbleness is more important than anything. And so... So, uh, you know, supply chain issues, you know, distribution, supply chain issues have become a, a huge problem. We've got, um, you know, we've got disruptions throughout it. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to get three books reprinted right now. It used to be we could always call and get a, I need, uh, you know, Pastor Poultry Profits reprinted, you know. Okay, 30 days and we get a new book. Now it's 90 days, even up to 180 days, six months. Why? Because contactless retail has shoved all the fiber industry that used to go into paper and cardboard all into paper with Amazon Prime and all those packages that used to come out of the stores in little baggies now have to go in a box to your front door and it has completely disrupted the supply chain to where the fiber industry is going into cardboard instead of paper. You know, who'd have thought something as generic as paper uh, would be that would be that difficult? And so the inventory uh, phrase now, instead of, instead of being... Um, just-in-time inventory, we've all grown up hearing that, right? Everything's about just-in-time, just-in-time. Now it's just-in-case. You know, how many people are inventorying more toilet paper at home than you did three years ago, right? And so this is, this is indicative of where things are. Um, the, the inventory, just the inventory of food. I mean, uh, you know, 80 years ago, if I, if I came here and I said, well, where's all the food? It would be in everybody's pantry. Um, in fact, in their larders. We don't even use the word larder anymore. You know, people, the food used to be in, in larders. Um, now, every city only, only carries three days worth of food in a city. So if there's a major crisis in three days, there's no food. And so homesteading actually, actually uh, uh, developing these food production, processing, distribution, and inventory abilities on a local level, proximate to where we live, actually creates a food security response to the kind of insecurity we're seeing out there with empty shelves. You know, I'm not, I wasn't born yesterday and I've never seen empty store shelves like I saw in the early uh, uh, 2020. And I think it got a lot of people's attention and you know we've just gotten used to there's there's always stuff around one of the things we've learned in this COVID thing i hope is that when world leaders kind of sit back and muse about things like in 2019 when the world economic forum did a week-long uh, uh, uh simulation of a worldwide uh plant i mean pandemic um Everybody thought, this is a ridiculous exercise. And within about eight months, it all came to pass. So now when Biden and, um, and Klaus Schwab of World Economic Forum and Bill Gates, these guys, when they sit back and kind of put their feet up on the Otterman and, and they're, they're you know, on, the, on the media thing and you hear them muse about, well, I think, I think there's gonna be some starvation. There's gonna be some food issues. We probably ought to take it seriously. And one way to take it seriously, of course, is to develop our own 
alternative universe. Another reason for the homestead tsunami and a, and a thing that it contributes to the society is family stability. Family stability, working together. The family is, is, uh, is disintegrating today in America. And we know psychologically that hardship creates relationship. That's one of the reasons why military people come back with such close friendships. You know, when you go through the hardship of a, of a war, uh, you get really close to people that you're depending on to, uh, you know, to, to shoot the bad guy before the bad guy gets you. Hardship creates deep, intimate relationships. You don't develop deep, intimate relationships bellying up to the bar, okay? You develop it in difficulty. It's in dealing with the, the fox and the chickens. Um, putting, sweating together, putting in a, putting in a, a, a fence post hole, uh, putting in a, a, you know, building something. Those are the kind of things. And so, so homesteading gives opportunities for family stability to, in hardship, develop those, um, those relationships. Self-actualization for our young people. Um, you know, we're raising a generation of young people that, um, that their, their greatest claim to fame is being the top points getter on Angry Birds or some other, you know, uh, video game. And, um, and you know, uh, I don't know what you think helps to affirm a person's worth and, and, and feeling needed, but there's something about going out there and, and, and watering the chickens or moving the goat or collecting the eggs, or weeding the green beans, picking the green beans, canning the green beans. You feel needed. And this idea that we can just kind of, kind of disconnect into some Nirvana Star Trek uh, uh, existence hovering above our ecological um, a womb and we'll be okay, uh, creates a culture that is A, full of hubris, like everything is at my fingertips. You know, you play a video game and you wreck your car, you wait about two seconds and the, and the game gives you a new car. That's not the way life works. When you're raising a tomato and the tomato plant dies, you don't just wait there and the garden gives you a new tomato. And so realizing that the world is not at my fingertips, that I am dependent, and my, and my affirmation, my self-worth, is all wrapped up in how I interact viscerally and participate in this thing. You know, no frog, we've got a lot of ponds on our farm, and uh, I've got a lot of frogs and toads and things like that. I've never walked by a pond and had a frog look up at me and say, mm, I'm not gonna participate today. I'm just not gonna participate. They've never said that. They all participate, and this notion that we can just be fed, be housed, be clothed with food and fiber and abundance. And all we got to do is press numbers and play games. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for the worthwhileness and the affirmation of people. The breakdown of the family creates a breakdown in society. I've got to get up because the tomatoes need picked. You know, those kinds of things create worth and wellness. Number three, childhood development. Man, oh man, do we need chores again. We need chores again to develop responsibility, dependability, resourcefulness, and a can-do spirit. Uh, I don't need to go into detail about entitlement, victimhood, and, and, and what I deserve and all that stuff, but... Um, I think that if we want really valuable adults, what we need is to develop valuable children. You know, I ran to a lady the other day, she said I grew up in uh, Washington State when all the apple orchards were really coming in there. And they would come down the street with a, um, instead of the ice cream truck, they'd come down, the, the orchards had a deal worked out with the schools, they'd, they'd have a print a schedule in the newspaper. and. 
the, the, the school bus would come down and if you were tall enough to, to, to be, you know, to, to be up to this particular line, then you'd get on the bus, you'd go out and you'd pick apples at a certain amount per bushel. They'd pay you cash, you'd get back on the bus and go home. That's how we got spending money. Today, our society would consider that child abuse. I consider prohibiting children from doing that child abuse. You know, um, think about muscles, just physical muscles. When I was talking to an army recruiter the other day, 80% of American young people don't qualify for the military physical. Think about that. 80% don't qualify for the military physical. Now, I'm not trying to turn everybody into a soldier here, but, but, but what does it suggest about a culture when 80% of its young people can't pass a military physical? But on a homestead, Toting five gallons. I mean, you're always carrying something on a homestead, right? I mean, that's all we do. What am I doing? I'm toting here. I'm, you know, I've got a feed scoop or I've got a basket or a bucket or something. I mean, I mean, in a homestead, the world revolves around five gallon buckets. Uh, I mean, if we didn't have banner twine, five gallon buckets and duct tape, we'd all be out of business. Oh, man. And, and we're all, you know, wheelbarrows. I mean, we're, we're pushing something, we're loading something, we're shoveling something. I mean, we get these we get these young people. We run this uh, you know formal apprenticeship stewardship program at our farm. You'd be you wouldn't believe almost every one of these young people. I've got to show them how to use a shovel. I got done. I put in a post hole with one of our apprentices. She has a she has a, a master's degree in math. Came to us as a six figure IT desk specialist for a global uh, company, and just got. Burned out, tired of sitting in her Dilbert cubicle at the end of an expressway, punching numbers in the cyberspace for, you know, for the man. And we got done putting in this post home. She looked at me and she said, man, I had no idea there was so much to learn about running a shovel in a post hole. Said, yeah, it's pretty nuanced, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's what skill's all about. That's what mastery is all about. And you know, and, and, and this and, and what we're doing is about reality, not fantasy. This isn't just a game. And I, I think that that the average young person who grows up never seeing a plant die, let alone a, a chicken die, seeing that cycle of 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 life, death, decomposition, regeneration, life, death, decomposition, regeneration, grows up in a fantasy world. Reality is it doesn't always go my way. And that's important to realize. It doesn't always go. I don't always get my way. You know, the, the, the lamb doesn't get better, especially a lamb, you know, or a, or a, or a baby turkey, a turkey poult. I mean, they only have one thing on their mind, to pick a more creative way to die. If you ever raised baby turkeys, you know what I'm talking about. Somewhere around six weeks, turkeys get brains, you know. About six weeks, they start to, to actually, you know, have some smarts. But, but to realize, in humility, and, and nothing humbles you like, like the fact that you just can't. If those chickens aren't laying, they get cold, and they get sick, there's nothing I can do to make them lay better. You know, when that... When that calf is stillborn and it's lying there in the straw and you've maybe helped the heifer get it pulled out and you got there too late or whatever and it's dead nothing you can do about it that humbles you and makes you realize there's something bigger than me and that's important for all of us to realize I, I, I'm really concerned that we're raising a nation of young people that thinks the world revolves around them. I want this, I want that, I want it now, I don't want to wait. And there's something about a homestead that helps us to realize I'm not in control of everything. It's bigger than me. And that's good. That creates common sense. And it makes, it makes relational important. You know, um, kids grow up I can't do, I'm not strong enough to do this. And so it develops a relational thing among siblings. 
a relational thing among parents. Here, let me help you. I'll lift that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. Collaboration, gratitude, thank you. Helping me, you know, lift that heavy bucket up here. Now I can take it from here. Those kinds of very simple little human interactions are developed on a homestead. Think about immunology, our immune systems. Goodness gracious, if we ever need an immune system, it's now. Finland, Finland leads the world on this. They've done numerous studies showing that kids that are raised with with um, with dirt and in barns and with animals have a far far superior immune system to kids raised in sterile environments and in fact so much so in Finland they're actually encouraging sales of dirt bags from farms to cities so that people can and listen, if there's an entrepreneur in a group come up to me, I think we need to launch a business here in the U.S. You know, you have these, uh, these welcome mats, you know, in front of your house. We need to make uh, a soil bladders, uh, uh, welcome mats, so that, uh, you know, it could be a subscription service. You know, a family pays 100 bucks a year. Every quarter we'll come and, 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 and toss out your, you know, your old dirt and put in new of your welcome mat. And so every time you walk in the house, you, know, you can step on it and get, get little powders of, of uh, farm microorganisms and, and, and good things uh, up in your, to build up your immune system because we now have incredibly uh, um, weak immune systems and a homestead builds immune systems. I mean, when you go out there and you butcher those chickens and then, uh, you know, stick your fingers in your mouth after they've right been in the intestines and all that, I mean, that, that's good. And those of you who know me know I routinely drink out of the out of the water tank with the cows. Cows are right here. I just go down and drink out of the water tank. I haven't had COVID, you know. I mean, man, oh man, uh, let's get a robust immune system by exercising. In the, I mean, Grandma was right. Every kid should eat a pound of dirt by their twelve. And I'm convinced that if they did, we'd have a much a much better immune system. Number four for the homestead tsunami is rural wealth. We have been draining economic wealth out of the countryside for a long, long time. The transfer of wealth from rural to urban is the, you know, is, is the current paradigm. In fact, it's been, it's been the current paradigm throughout history. I'm going to switch sheets here. A lot of wind here today. So, so this idea of, of wealth, um, you know, when, when we have a lot of homesteads in a rural community, it drives, it drives wealth to the rural, and that's a good thing. We don't, we don't need to have it all in city banks. Think about, think about uh, social wealth in the rural community, bringing back social structure. Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, read Little House on the Prairie books, right? A lot of Little House on the Prairie. You know, remember how those communities used to have fun at night? They didn't have television. They didn't have radio. Um, how'd they have fun? Well, they'd have a they'd have a community wide spelling bee. Remember that? They'd have a they'd have a community wide everybody uh, everybody bring your favorite poem, and we'll have a we'll have a contest see who can you know who who can write the best poem and and present it to us or or uh, read the best poem, or uh, that sort of thing. You know, it was it was this it was this. Um, I, I mean, and debates. I mean, they had all sorts of surrogate. You know, because they didn't have they didn't have uh, uh, TV news, and so if there was a like a, a presidential debate, um, you know, a, a nationwide presidential debate, they would have surrogates all the way down to the local level who would come and, and stand in and, and do a and do a, a presidential debate with surrogates at the local level. You know, those guys. That was that was community entertainment. Homesteading, I think, is is key is key to bringing that back. Homesteading brings creativity like we haven't seen. The innovation. I mean, think about a skyscraper. You go to the city. Look at that skyscraper. I mean, can you imagine if the amount of engineering creativity to build a skyscraper, if that were on our homesteads, what we could have? I mean, we could have we could have self-moving. Uh, Self-moving eggmobiles, you know, 
Uh, we can have self-moving shade mobiles. We uh, we can have we can have uh, a video monitoring of the uh, of the animal water trough. So when the cows dump it over, we can check on our computer and see if the cows dumped over the the uh, the trough. I mean, there are lots of things that we could uh, develop, and, and and having more of us doing this uh, creates brings that creativity to the to the country. Number five, resilient land management. <clears throat> resilient land management. You know, if you're keeping up with the way uh, soil is being handled in the U.S., you know that we are still losing soil at dramatic rates in this country. Desertification, we're losing our aquifers, all that sort of thing. We're, we're, we're still doing an, an, an ecological disservice to our, to our landscape. Homesteaders, it's interesting that here at this uh, fair, we've got, what have we got? I don't know, uh, Megan, 47, 50 vendors. There's not a single one selling chemical 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. There's not a single one out here trying to convince you you really need to use glyphosate. Roundup. There's no Roundup sales. Monsanto is not here. And so one of the best things that the homesteading tsunami is bringing to our culture is a new ecological perspective. This is not Democrat, Republican. It's not liberal, conservative. It's, it's not... It, it, it passes all uh, uh, partisanship. We, why? Because there's something about gardening and farming close to where you live that makes you really care about what you're putting on. Now, if you're farming from 500 miles away and all of your decisions are made by some uh, academic um, uh, artificial intelligent software program running a tractorless John Deere across the field with GPS satellite. It's like Wendell Berry says. He, Wendell Berry says, nurturing requires love, and love requires intimate knowledge. And it's hard to love something you don't know anything about. And a person can only know something about so big an area. And the, and, and the bigger the area, the farther you are removed from it, the less you can love it because the less you know about it, and suddenly there's no accountability in the program. Does that, follow, does that make sense? And so, so here, what we have are compost. We have biomass programs, cover crops. That's what homesteaders get. And so, in my view, one of the reasons I love the homesteading tsunami is because I know that the chance of an acre touched by a homesteader, that acre is going to be better tended than any acre that Bill Gates buys. So let's, so let's increase our acreage, all right? May our, may our footprint increase, okay? Because that's going to build soil. Diversity, you know, just just from a resilient land management uh, a process, diversity of plants and animals and edge effect. Most of us sitting here, we actually enjoy seeing wildlife. We see wildlife as an asset. In conventional industrial agriculture, wildlife is considered a liability. Now, it's interesting that in the 1950s, the old uh, Soil Conservation Service, it's defunct now, but old Soil Conservation Service, they would do... Um, they would do uh, uh, grant, you know, um, cost share programs with farmers to build ponds. Today, they want all those ponds filled in because they make nesting places for waterfowl, which might bring in high path avian influenza. Listen, when, when ponds and hydrology and water become a liability, and bumblebees become a liability, and robins become a liability, and wood ducks become a liability, and deer become a wild, uh, uh, oh, I'm saying it too many times, deer become a liability. That is a farming system that is 
anti-diversity. And if there's one thing we know about healthy, successful ecosystems, it is they are pretty diverse. They're not monocultures. They're not monospecies. They're heavily diversified. And so what we want are a lot of edge effects. We want plants and animals in proximity. We want a more meticulous, what I call, eyes to acre ratio. Again, we can, we can know better how to handle a piece of land when we have more eyes to acre ratio. When there aren't any eyes to acre ratio, there's no accountability. In, uh, you know, around our place, um, in, in, in the greater culture, when you have an idea, uh, the, the question is always, oh, that's a great idea. How big can it be? You know, we're always saying, how big can it be? How big can it be? Around our farm, our first question with a new idea is always, that's cool. How small can it be? How small can it be? Because if it doesn't work small, it won't work big. And that's a, that's a major difference. And, and we homesteaders, that's the way we're thinking. We're, we're not thinking how big can it be. We're thinking how small it can be and small can be beautiful. Think about hydration. You know, we're all, we're all looking at how to put in, you know, uh, uh, gutter barrels, rain barrels, cisterns, uh, small ponds, fish ponds, those kinds of things. That kind of meticulous, intimate caressing of our landscape is what we bring to our culture, to our, to our farmscapes. That's an important thing. You know, mainline agriculture views nature as some sort of a, a reluctant partner that we've got to get in a half Nelson. And I'm going to force you and make you grow me these, you know, wheat or apples or corn. You know, I'm going to, right? Um, whereas we view nature as a benevolent lover that just wants to be caressed in the right places. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. And so we come to this under gratitude and benevolence rather than violence and exploitation. Number six, number six, homesteading, I think, brings practical skills back. Practical skills back. I don't know about you, but if the wheels fall off, I want to be next to somebody who knows how to grow things, fix things, and build things. That is the that is the the ultimate 401k plan, okay. And I've been contacted actually. This is I'm not making this up. In the last oh 16 months, by four billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires. These are folks with private jets. They can go anywhere they want to in the world. They've contacted me saying. Can you help us find an agrarian bunker for our family? If the wheels fall off, we need to get somewhere safe. Now, there's an old business saying, if you want to know where to put your money, look where the rich people are putting their money. And let me tell you, there are rich people putting their money in land. I don't want to get into a big old, you know, cryptocurrency land, gold, silver, that sort of thing. But I will tell you that that being proximate, geographically proximate to people, to communities, and knowing name face-to-face, person-to-person, people who know how to build things, fix things, and grow things is a better future retirement plan and has more resilience to it than all the stocks and bonds you can buy today. And that's what homesteading brings to it. People routinely come up to me and say, look, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what to do, except I know this. I just want to disentangle from the system. I just want to disentangle from the system. Anybody have that sense? You know, if I asked everybody here, pull out a piece of paper and write all the things you're frustrated and angry about. We could all make a list, right? Here's my encouragement for you. Don't take all that energy and get ulcers over it. Okay? Take all that energy and funnel it into creative innovation, building a parallel universe in your life. 
building your ark, which will probably mean building relationships with people who know how to grow things, fix things, and build things. Okay? And if we invest in those relationships, those skills, those practical things, we will be able to better disentangle from the system. I don't have all the answers. I mean, I wish I could unplug. I'd like to go back to like like uh, beads and wampum myself. I mean, that would be just fine with me. Um, but you know, it's a complicated world. It's a complicated society, and so whatever we can do to build this, what I call this this parallel universe, uh, is is a big deal. Number seven, home entertainment. Homesteads provide us the opportunity for home entertainment think about how many people around the world pay big money to enjoy a sunrise like you get to see on your homestead or a sunset like you get to see on your homestead people pay big money for those kinds of things that beauty that beauty that we create on our homesteads the sunrise the sunset the farmscape that we create is a privilege. People ask me, what, you know, what gets you up in the morning? You know what gets me up in the morning? What gets me up in the morning is I get to walk out and have the privilege and the honor of being hands and feet to caress, to be a, a, a the, the creator's masseuse of his ecology. That's a wonderful privilege. None of us should take it lightly. And on our homesteads, they enable us to viscerally participate. We don't have to sit there and wonder, you know, wonder about a, a, a piece of land. We get to exercise it and participate on our own piece of land. We don't have to, we don't have to be, you know, sitting in the stands watching the game play out and, and feeling, like, oh, I, I can't be involved in this. No, we can actually involve it in beauty. We can involve it in enjoyment. Man, oh man, you ever move a move a, a, a flock of sheep or move a herd of cows? I mean, they kick up their heels, they dance. To be able to, to be a part of that, people say, why are you so happy? Man, who gets to wake up every morning and go out and make 3,000 3, chickens dance when they get into a new uh, salad bar? Okay? That's cool. You know, they're all chasing the bus. Very few of us get to make that many beings happy every day. We get to do that on our homesteads. That's a privilege. Cavorting animals. Milk. Milk plinking into a pail. We're sitting there milking the goat or the cow, and that milk's hitting the pail, and the cat comes by, and you take the teat, and you turn it sideways and squirt it into the cat's mouth. Blah, 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 you know, the cat. You know, I mean, that, that, that is entertainment. If, if, that doesn't, if that doesn't turn you on, as much as, you know, uh, going to the city and, and doing something in the city, I, I, I don't have any hope for you. You know, it's, it's, it's too bad. Think about the exercise you get. You don't have to go to the gym. You know, you can, you can shut down your, you know, your gym membership and, and, and carry buckets of water, you know. Um, carry, carry buckets of eggs, you know. You, you, you get your own exercise. Think about the discovery on your farm. I mean, uh, going around the pond looking for frogs and toads and salamanders and newts. I mean, kids kids can find a hundred things. You don't have to go to the city for entertainment. I don't know how many people have, how do you how do you stand the country? It's so, it's so quiet. And then they come out there at night and they look up, wow, stars. I never saw the stars before. Look at the, at the sky. Yeah, the stars been there a long time. We get to enjoy that. We get to enjoy the the um, the, the, the the spring peepers. You know, um, we have a <clears throat> swimming pool there in the yard and cover it up. You know, of course it gets water on it and spring comes and it gets all uh, gets all full of you know leaves and kind of funky water and tadpoles and stuff by spring and tadpoles come and start growing. And we had a guy there doing some work on the house and he came running around the corner one time and he, he said, them, uh, you know what those frogs are doing in your swimming pool? They're having sex in your swimming pool. That's great. It's better than an X-rated movie. You know, this is cool. 
We, we get all this at our doorstep. We get to enjoy that at our doorstep. Home entertainment, I mean, it doesn't get any better than the, than, than the uh, homestead. Relaxation, I mean, how many of us, how big an area does it take to have a picnic table in the woods? All you got to do is just walk into the set of the woods and the world just, it's like it's not there. It's cool, right? Um, recreation, you know, from volleyball to paintball. You know, people pay big money to get out and have enough room to run, enough room to, to explore, enough room to discover, enough room to see the landscape. And we get to do it every day and be entertained by the hand of a benevolent creator. I'm getting there. Number eight, the homestead tsunami brings a wonderful economic investment. You know, who trusts Wall Street right now? Where do you put your money? You put it in, you put it in real stuff that has intrinsic value like land, animals, plants, soil. I suggest that, I suggest that, that is a good place to put our investments, to put our money. And it will yield as long as the sun shines, the rain comes down, and we can steward this. It'll pay. It, it'll pay more definite, definite dividends, risk-free dividends, than playing the system. Economic investment in feeding ourselves first. Yeah, I'm all about helping others, but you know we can't help others if we don't feed ourselves first. Um, I was with Dell Big Tree recently, High Wire. Some of you probably are familiar with Dell Big Tree, and um, we were had this uh, this panel discussion up in New York, and there were some some folks on the panel that just that, that they were really concerned about. Well, uh, uh, what do we do with the people that don't get this? I mean, the the people that don't understand and they don't. Del Big Tree, I loved it, man. He said, he said, listen, if we're building an ark over here, when it starts to rain, is not the time to sit there and argue with somebody that doesn't even know it's raining. The way we lead is build the ark, and when it starts raining, go to the ark. Now, if you want to come with me, that's great. There's room for all of us. We've got a nice big ark here. But I'm not going to sit here and miss my ride because you don't get it. I thought, you know, he, he said there will be people that just die. And, you know, it sounds cruel. But, folks, if we don't create health, physical health, spiritual health, mental health, emotional health, relational health, earthworm health, if we don't create that first for ourselves, we can't lead anybody. We won't be able to lead anybody out of the wilderness. And so that's what our homesteads allow us to do. You know, Wendell Berry talks about um, one of the reasons that the society doesn't embrace this is because it doesn't feed the economic system. He has a phrase, he says, um, what's wrong with us creates more GDP than what's right with us. You know, and, and the nation of Bhutan, there uh, next to India, uh, back in the 1950s, they created a gross domestic happiness index. They said gross domestic product is not a good way to measure societal health. The way to measure is gross domestic happiness. They had a four a four pillared program with mathematical formulas to determine how happy the population was. In our culture, we have we we, we don't care about societal happiness. I mean, if we got to build ten more prisons, wow! Look at all that GDP, that concrete and steel, you know, this jobs. I mean, if I go out and pollute the river in front of my house, that's not a societal negative. That's a positive because now we gotta hire people to come in and clean it up. And we gotta buy petroleum and we gotta buy trucks and we gotta get it all in there to clean it up. 
And so that's what Wendell Berry says, you know, what's wrong with this creates more GDP than what's right with this. I would say that a culture that hasn't figured out how to capture true societal losses like this, like, for example, a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico, like infertile frogs, like three-legged three salamanders, like salmonella, E. coli, a diabetes epidemic, Autism, off the charts. MRSA, C. diff, C. diff superbugs, antibiotic resistance. If a culture cannot capture the economic loss of those kinds of externalities, we're doomed. Yeah, you would think that a culture as clever as us that went to the moon and that you know uh, developed cool little you know HIMAR missiles for the uh, Ukrainians to kick the Russians out. You know, you'd think that a culture that was that clever would be clever enough to capture, to be able to articulate what is a societal loss and what isn't. But we don't. And so the chances, the chances of rectifying this from the top down are pretty slim. People say, well, you know, this seems so simple. Why, you know, why don't, why don't people make a change? Well, because if people did what you and I believe, it would completely invert the power, position, and profits of the entire farming and food system. And that's a big ship to turn around. So that's why our change has to be from the bottom up. Just like, you know, it took 500 years for Europe to develop the ultimate war machine, which was a mounted, mail-clad, lance-gripping knight. And it only took about five years for the whole system to collapse with the invention of gunpowder. I would like to suggest that the castles of our culture, the castles of our culture are in jeopardy with our gunpowder. We are the bottom-up gunpowder to start to take down some of these castles. Number nine, social structure. Homesteading brings a, a renewed desire and a joy in social structure, sharing expertise. There is, you know, I've visited mo all these vendors here, some of them twice or three times today, and I don't have, I don't see a spirit of, I got mine, you can't have yours. Or, I'm going to patent this, I'm not giving you the recipe. Or, I'm not going to show you how I build this. In our community, we have an ultimate love and a desire to share expertise. It's not about denying competition. It's about encouraging collaboration and complementarity. We love to share infrastructure. You're a homesteader, what are you looking for? You're looking for somebody maybe with a front end loader. You're looking for somebody with a bandsaw mill. You're looking for somebody with uh, what chainsawing expertise or know how to sharpen a chainsaw. Looking for somebody who uh, has a, uh, expertise in water, laying water lines. Um, maybe somebody who's gonna mow your hay or put it up or you know, those kinds of things. That is, that is a sharing infrastructure. And it's something that we bring to our communities is a new sense of, of sharing that sort of thing. An integrated neighborhood and village where we're integrated, we're not segregated. And, you know, villages do raise better kids. Uh, they are raised better in villages and communities, not just sitting in the basement playing video games. And we bring that to our communities where we balance rugged individualism with community. There is a balance there. You know, I don't want to downplay the idea of individual freedom and liberty and that sort of thing, but I also want to bolster it with the idea that we need to invest in our communities and realize that our team includes, yes, the guy with the trailer that hauls our pig to the butcher, the butcher that does the pig, the, the um, you know, the, the grain mill that mills the grain for the chickens, the, um, 
you know, the, 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 the seed supplier that supplies the seeds for our, you know, for our tomatoes, the, all that, that is all part of our neighborhood, our village, our team, our community, so that we're actually developing mutual, inter, mutual interdependence. One of the biggest uh, uh, fallacies of the homestead movement, and I think one of the things that, that the naysayers uh, poke fun at us, and we need to be careful to guard against, is us oh, just a bunch of loose cannons. They're all just out there. You know, they all want to just do their own thing and, 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 and pollute everything, and they don't care about uh, uh, stewardship or anything else. They're just, they're just out there you know, doing their own thing. And, and while, we, while we appreciate that and honor that, we also need to realize that in our homesteading movement, we need to understand we are bounded and we are, we are, we are embracing um, a higher set of, of boundaries, a higher set of, of template uh, design than, than, the, um, uh, than, than the big uh, in, um, um, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations and all that stuff. Finally, number 10. Number 10, our homesteading movement, I think, the homestead tsunami creates a whole different faith perspective. A whole different faith perspective because we jump in, we, we jump into a, a, a model that is bigger than us. Cycles and seasonality are so important. Man, if you're a homesteader, you get the fact that it's hot in the summer, it's cold in the winter, it doesn't rain every day. Every day is not, you know, 70 and puffy clouds and green grass. There are droughts, there are floods, there's wind, there's hail, there's, um, there's a, a sick animal, there's pneumonia, there's a, there's a fungus among us, okay? There's, you know, uh, things, things happen. Today is not everything. And we learn patience. And that is a true virtue, patience. Our impatience has gotten us into situations culturally where when we ask for very fast solutions to perceived issues, we get all sorts of problems. I don't want to get too sidetracked here in a rabbit hole, but you know, demanding a solution to COVID. What did we get? demanding a solution to anything quickly is a problem. And on our homesteads, we learn patience. There are cycles. We don't need solutions to everything today. We didn't get where we are today. We won't get out of it in a day. And we certainly don't need a government solution for every problem we can imagine. Yeah. And so being patient to let the market adjust to solutions, for letting the market to innovate things, is, is so wrapped up in our psyche as homesteaders. I remember in the early 70s, um, we would take our, or I'm sorry, uh, in the early 80s, uh, we would take our, our automobiles to, a, we had a, a, a neighbor mechanic. And yes, he was part of our community. And instead of going to town, we went just up the road a little bit to a guy that had a little, you know, backyard garage thing. He could fix anything. And um, our money never went to town. Our money just went, you know, uh, uh, back and forth between neighbors. And um, I remember him telling me that in the 1960s, there were several, more than four, um, backyard kind of innovators who developed a 100 mile per gallon carburetor for automobiles. In the 60s, the time of muscle cars, V8 engines, and big Thunderbirds, okay? 100 MPG, but every one of them got bought either by a petroleum company or an automaker. As soon as the patent was filed, bought the patent, shut it down, no 100 mile per gallon carburetor. That was in the 60s, okay? Every time the culture demands a fast governmental solution, think about, think about Food Safety Inspection Service. 1906, Upton Sinclair writes The Jungle. 
Within six months of that book coming out, the big seven meat suppliers in the nation lost 50%, half of their sales within six months. Wow. The market responded to information. But the big meat packers went to Teddy Roosevelt, I call him Teddy Rooseveltsky because he was really a socialist. They went to him and said, look, we're gonna lose our shirts. We need you to help us. So Teddy Roosevelt, being a big governmenter, um, he said, okay, well, I'll give you the Food Safety Inspection Service to, to cover their tails. And with a little uh, US duh, US duh, uh, blue buzz on meat packages, save their tail and suddenly, where did people go when they quit buying from the seven big ones? Well, they went back to neighborhoods. They went back to It was the biggest migration. This was early in the Industrial Revolution. It was the biggest migration of meat sales from the big seven back to their community local little butcher shops. And that was stopped because the culture, the society demanded an instant cure, which was food safety inspection service. Here we are 100 years later, and we've got four companies instead of seven that control half of the nation's meat supply we've got four that control 85 percent of the meat supply and the naysayers are well that that's that's the, that's how that's how the free market works and what more government control when actually it was that fast government response that has gradually pushed us in the last hundred years to an oligarchical monopolistic system. It's that intervention. So our homesteads teach us patience. We're not in control of everything. Rains comes when it wants to. Wind comes when they want to. I'm not in control of everything. It teaches us respect for life. You know, it does, it does affect me when I walk into the pig pen where the pigs are and realize if I just lie down here for 30 minutes, they will eat me. Uh, pigs are different than cows. I can go down and lie down in the field with the cows for a day, and they don't eat me. You know, they'll come up and lick me, and you know, slobber all over me, and all that. But they don't. And so, we, because we are close to our animals, we're close to our tomatoes, we're close to our grapevines. We we develop a deep sense of respect and honor for their physiological distinctiveness. Okay, and and. As you caress and as you learn about it and you do your trials, you will find those wonderful abundance, abundance themes within our farmscape and our landscape. This is not a place that's getting ready to run out. What it's asking for is for us to run in and participate and be a part of it so that as we make our list of things to be frustrated and angry about, we take that list, post it somewhere, it's okay, get it out of your system. But we take all that angst, all that energy, and we turn it around so that we create havens and bunkers and places of refuge so that when society becomes hopeless and helpless, we provide places of hope and help. That's where we need to go. That's where we need to take our energy. That's the objective out there. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you for attending this wonderful fair. Thank you for investing your day here. We know you could have been any place else besides here, but you chose to be here. We honor and, and, and respect that and appreciate it. And hope we'll see a lot of you tomorrow. And we've been provided a wonderful, uh, blessed day today. Uh, have we had a great day? Yes. yes, we have. Thank you, Josh and Megan, for leading on this and for, uh, for not sitting back and just waiting for somebody else to take the reins, but getting on that horse and riding it to today. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and the honor to be here. Blessings on you. Thank you. Now, was that amazing or what? Oh my gosh, I loved every minute of it. I was sitting there, I was just listening like I didn't even want to be anywhere else in the world. I just wanted to be right there and then listen to what was going on. I tell you what, I hope that you all enjoyed this and thank you very much for joining us 
right here at Herbal Gardens Homestead and listening to Joel Salatin. Thank you, Joel. And remember, love your land and it'll love you back. Take care.